It was nice to, to have uh, Kirk in front of me. I, I want to read something from his bio. And, and I will say that I titled my presentation, uh, you know, some guys still wear suits, and I fell victim to a stereotype. I assumed I'm coming to talk to a, a clean tech group. And so by definition, uh, and Kirk actually delivered, jeans, purple belt, um, but he's an ultra endurance runner, open water swimmer, and competitive golfer. I, I warn you, I'm none of those. I am a uh, boring energy guy. So with that caveat, bear with me. What I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, our firm, I think uh, Brad did a good job of, of talking about what we do. Uh, we're all energy all the time, about 150 employees here in Houston. Uh, we, we're in the securities business. We're in the investment advisory business. We're in the asset management business, again, all focused around energy. Um, but when you think about uh, energy, when I think about it, I tend to think oil and gas. I tend to think conventional energy. And so my goal or job today is essentially talk to you a little bit about how we see the conventional energy world. And hopefully that helps frame for, for you guys the, the, some of the constraints and or opportunities that uh, you'll be operating under if you're attacking the power business or the oil and gas business as, as your space. Um, so by definition, you know, the, the conventional energy guys, right, we are the dinosaurs compared to, uh, compared to the kind of cool, sexy, alternative energy clean tech. Um, dinosaurs have been around a long time. I think five years ago, if I'd have given this talk, uh, it almost felt that environment was either or. Right? You, were either, you were either conventional energy guy or alternatives were the enemy. Right? Today what I'd say is essentially uh, the frenemy of clean tech is oil and gas. Why? Uh, because uh, essentially the conventional oil and gas business or the energy business has really had a big renaissance. It's a growth business now in the U.S. from the perspective of, of all these new resources, uh, which is going to take a long time to develop but it's happening at pretty high commodity prices. And so that generally is the umbrella under which uh, there's a lot of opportunity to capture economic value. And I think that's the, so we've moved from enemy to frenemy. And um, in the near term, you know, one of the things that I'm gonna say the obvious here, but there's obviously a lot of macro headwinds around the globe, whether it be what's going on in Europe or slower growth, growth but slower in China, fiscal cliff in the U.S., there's a ton of uncertainty around what's happening in the world, and that does matter. You can't get away from that uh, when you think about conventional energy. And I think the other thing that uh, anyone that's been watching this business for a long time knows is that cycles, whether it's transitioning from conventional energy to clean tech or within energy, um, takes a long time, right? Uh, I'm going to show you a slide in a little bit that shows a 24-year decline in U.S. oil production, which turned last year and is now climbing, right? These things, these cycles take a long time to play out. And in general, one of my fundamental tenets of things that I believe, and it doesn't matter what industry it is, is if you have a business that makes money, right, that is the ultimate job security. So um, I'll expound on all these as I go forward. So as we think about sort of traditional energy, one of the things that is underlying what's happening in North America right now is there is really a renaissance. And I spoke here at this very building about a year ago, and the title then with this very same picture was North American Renaissance Unfolding. And I'd actually argue that it is a North American renaissance. There's a lot of stuff happening in shale. If you haven't heard about shale and shale drilling and the shale boom, then um, then I don't know what to say. You can leave now, but um, it's, it is clearly a trend that has a ton of legs to it, and it's, it's a combination of the resource that's been there for millions of years and an ability to get it out that we did not have before. It's growing here. It started in 2003 in the Barnett Shale in, up in Dallas, and it's expanded to the oil side of the equation, and before all is said and done, we are going to be doing a lot around the world with the technology that we're developing here. And, and I think Jim Sledzik earlier today talked about, uh, he may have said it a little bit differently, but my view would be oil and gas uh, has actually gotten easier to find over the last little while, right? It's not easy, but it's easier. 
And so, did you say that, Jim? I see you smiling, yeah. And, and that is creating a lot of opportunities. So I think that in terms of, of the outlook for the business, it's as good as I've seen it in a very, very long time. But what's going on in, with this renaissance is also uh, making conventional oil and gas much more competitive with other alternatives. Here's my chart on what's going on in the US. That's the 24 year decline in oil production. Shale has turned it and there are folks talking about, we import about eight and a half million barrels a day of oil into the US and the politicians are saying we're gonna be energy independent. Um, I don't know what was said earlier today. I'm gonna to tell you that's gonna be very, very difficult. But growing from the current level of production by 50%, or 75% won't get us completely energy independent, but it's gonna get us a lot less dependent. It's very meaningful. Um, again, emphasizing this whole issue of economics, uh, what I, I'm showing you here, it's a pretty busy chart. The blue bars are year over year gasoline demand. So if they're going up, we're growing. If they're going down, we're declining. What would my point be here? We spent a long time with rising gasoline prices and rising demand. How did that happen? Well, we hadn't hit a pain point. So gasoline went essentially from $1.50 on that red line to about three bucks. And then at the same time, we ran into a global slowdown. But the point would be price does matter. And price is now at a point where when price goes up, demand's going to go down. And if price goes down, demand's probably going to respond. And so we found that pain point, and until global economies are a lot better, the price of, of the commodity matters a lot. So a few years ago before shale kicked in, a lot of talk about peak oil. And my view would be that, I shudder to say it, our peak oil guys are right. Their time frame has just been off, and potentially off by a lot. Right, we are running out of a resource. Anytime you produce a scarce resource, right, you're moving toward peak oil. Um, I think the reality is we, we are moving toward more expensive oil, so cheap oil is definitely running out, uh, and that's happening fairly quickly. But again, back to this issue that I showed in, in the gasoline price, you know, what we're seeing is essentially if WTI crude price is above 100, demand is falling and below about 80, supply is falling. So if I'm sitting in the shoes of this audience thinking about where do I need to be competitive, I don't think you have to spend a ton of time worrying that oil's gonna be 50 or $60 a barrel because supply will fall if that's the case. I think you don't need to spend a lot of time hoping crude's gonna be 120 or 50 or 200 because demand's gonna go down if that happens. So 80 to 100 is the right range to think about crude we'll have, we'll blip above and we'll blip below, but essentially we're finding equilibrium for now in this 80 to $100 a barrel range. And, and by the way, the financial markets, the futures curve would also show about $90 a barrel out longer term. Natural gas, um, a big issue. Five years ago, we were running out of natural gas. Now we're swamped in. And maybe eight years ago, we were running out of natural gas. And now we have a lot. Prices have gone from 12 to 3. And essentially the, the BTU relationship that should exist between oil and gas, the price relationship, 6 to 1 or so, is completely blown apart. And it's going to be that way for a while. And, um, you know, the, the key message here is current gas prices, natural gas prices, they're, they're not economic and therefore they're not sustainable. Doesn't mean they're going to get better quickly. But $3 gas, the industry doesn't make enough money, period. So um, what's happening in an environment when gas prices aren't economic? Think we, we think about a couple things. Demand is growing, but it's going to grow slowly. There are lots of new plants being built to burn natural gas, whether it's a power plant, chemicals, et cetera. But those plants are 2015, 2016. And you know, the calendar today says September 2012. So we got a long way between here and demand growth. It's visible, but it's going to take a little while. The flip side of that is, is folks that are spending money on natural gas are reacting very quickly. So drilling activities 
fallen a ton. I'll show you that in a second. Um, so drilling activity is rolling fast, but it takes a while for production to roll over. So the response to lower drilling is we're getting less new production, but that old production is still there, right? So production's rolling, but it's rolling slowly. And for the first time in a very long time, for the last year or so, gas and coal have actually been competing with, with each other. Coal has always been the very cheap baseload provider of power. But when gas falls to $2.50, all of a sudden you're in competition. And so as prices recover, we're gonna have to give some of that demand back to coal. And again, that will be a little bit of an overhang. The final thing when you think about supply demand for natural gas is that six or seven years ago, we were going to export, uh, sorry, import a lot of gas. We we're gonna bring gas into the country. All those facilities are now being talked about, turned around and we're gonna send gas out of the country, right? We were short of supply, now we're long on supply. So we're gonna send it out, we're gonna export. Same issue as the, the power plants and the chemical plants that take a long time to convert an, uh, an import facility to an export facility. So 2016 plus. So my takeaway here is $3 gas doesn't work, but that doesn't mean it's going to get fixed real quickly. I tend to think that $5 gas is the right answer, but we're not gonna see that for several years. So again, if I think about the environment under which I want to build a company, $80 to $100 oil and $5 gas, plus or minus 50 cents or something like that. So the, those are sort of the overarching um, areas in which I think the, the economics of the business work. Um, this just shows you what happens when commodity prices change uh, and when opportunities change. The, the dark line is gas rig count. It's fallen by 75%. The red line is oil rig count, and it's up sevenfold, right? When prices change, people's behavior changes. This is the, this is the fight that we've got against coal. If you're a natural gas producer, uh, gas has stolen demand from coal-fired power. Uh, when price improves for natural gas, coal is going to start stealing some of that demand back. And then this is just a chart showing you this production role that I was talking about. Um, here are the dark lines. This is the Barnett Shale and the Haynesville Shale. The dark lines are production. The red lines are rig count. And you'll notice that rig count falls off and production doesn't fall off nearly as quickly. And so that's this time lag that we're fighting in terms of fixing the supply side of the equation with excess natural gas. So again, oil at 80 to 100, natural gas at, at five. Um, that's how we think about the, the umbrella under which a successful and profitable company's got to be able to operate. Um, so I wanna shift from talking about how I see the kind of conventional energy business to as I think about how uh, clean tech and alternative energy um, wins over time, right? Inherently, what we're talking about are, are people making changes in their behavior for the most part. Because right now, the traditional standard way things operate, it's, you know, whether it's, it's any industry, but, you know, it's a technology, it's a process, it's an idea. Right, you've got to change from what you were doing to what the quote unquote new thing is. And so I started thinking about why do people make changes and, and how that has an implication for the clean tech business. And so again, keep in mind, I'm a traditional oil and gas guy. So I could be totally wrong. And I encourage you guys afterwards to come up and tell me where I'm wrong and that'll make me smarter. But when I think about why are people gonna make changes and I, I'm ranking these, in my opinion, from uh, sort of least important or less important to more important, particularly from a sustainable perspective. But one of the reasons people make changes is because they just like one thing better than another. And when I think about what that means for clean tech, right, there are early adopters. There are folks that say, this is cool, I want to do it, right? This is the right thing to do. 
you know, there's an environmental angle to this as well. Uh, people that are early adopters or do something because they think it's the right thing, they care less about price and more about doing that right thing, which is fantastic, except the constituency there is pretty small, right? The early adopters are a pretty small piece of the total market. The other reason you make a change, or another reason you make a change, is if you can't get what you want, you find an alternative, right? So I think these are loaves of bread, um, but at the end of the day, how does that apply? Less relevant in my mind to, to this industry. I mean, if you're isolated geographically and you can't get gasoline, you figure out something else. You can't get diesel, you can't, you know. But um, generally around the world, you know, you can get oil and gas. And so it's less significant. Um, this is one of my favorite. Um, why do you, why do you do something different or make a change? You do it because you have to, or the consequences are uh, very draconian. And so, you know, in, in, in our business, right, you're not going to go to jail, but at the end of the day, one of the things that the government is telling us to do, uh, for instance, if you look to California, are, are um, mandates around renewable standards, right? So you don't go to jail if you don't do it, but again, pretty power, powerful incentive to uh, make a change. You know, the, the one thing that I do believe over time, right, over time is that uneconomic mandates are unsustainable. You can't ask people to do something that doesn't make money indefinitely, right? There's a limit. Um, when you can't meet goals, a lot of times you push those goals out, but usually those goals are sustained. And somebody's got to pay for mandates, and so, which leads me to this next thought around um, what helps make people make changes, right? And so if you've got mandates or you want to encourage behavior, what do you do? You incentivize them. And so when I think about subsidies, right, subsidies work uh, historically in, in the, the business, you know, that we're talking about here. So, you know, Brazil has a significant chunk of their transportation's ethanol because for 20 years, they encourage people to use ethanol. Uh, you can tie, if you look at U.S. Wind, you can tie the number of permits and projects that go forward directly to uh, the tax incentives and the timing of the tax incentives. And then Europe has obviously got a lot of alternatives that they're encouraging via the government, which is great. It makes things happen. The flip side is that, that you wind up in situations where um, I'm uh, again, a big free market guy, and so I clearly believe that if you incentivize to do something, someone to do something, they will do it until you remove that incentive, and they'll do it to excess, right? So there is certainly moral hazard associated with it, and somebody's got to pay for it, right? The government typically pays for it uh, in, in this business, but uh, someone has to pay for it if a subsidy by definition says you're making up uh, something between uneconomic and economic. Now we're getting to the stuff that's, I think, pretty exciting uh, as it relates to the dynamics around change. And so I think the demise of the typewriter was, the, there was an article, I did this via Google, right, the last typewriter factory closed in India in 2011. And then, of course, there's a bunch of other articles say, that's not true, there are still factories making typewriters, but the whole point is, um, you know, better mousetrap wins. You know, typewriters are replaced by something else. And so, at the end of the day, what's going on in this room is, in theory, all of, all of these companies that are presenting today are coming up with something that is better, right? And coming up with something better in a huge market, right? Billions and billions and billions associated with conventional oil and gas production and power, right? So the biggest market in the world and trying to find a way to snip at the edges of that. That's pretty powerful. I think inherently um, there's the realization, and again, it's why I say I'm a dinosaur and I know it and, and that's why some of the sponsors of this conference are traditional energy producers is because at some point in time, fossil fuels will not be the answer. And so you've got that wind at your back here 
Um, and what we know is capital will flow to good ideas. I think, Brad, you said $2 billion or something raised by the, the companies that have presented at all of your technology forums. Um, you know, that better mousetrap will capture capital. And then I think the, again, the thing that's, this is my last slide on this topic, it's, um, and therefore, um, by definition, I'm telling you it's the most important, which is, you know, what I call the wallet factor. If something makes money, right, that, again, I said at the beginning, that's the, that's the most compelling job security there is. Capital will run to ideas that make money, right? A neat idea that has to be proven, maybe it can raise some money. A neat idea that is making money gathers a ton of capital, right? It's not easy, but um, good ideas do get money. I, I say here, beware of the cyclical head fakes. Um, the last big rally in crude oil, oil WTI went to about 125, and the prediction was 200. If you're making decisions on cyclical highs or cyclical lows, but cyclical highs tends to be where people get caught more, um, that is really dangerous. Something that works at 200 probably doesn't work at 100. You know, that's a great way uh, to get your head chopped off. Um, you know, the, one of the neatest things I think about this industry, clean tech, et cetera, is that, you know, oil and gas are conventional energies big, there's a lot of dollars there and um, pretty stodgy, you know, relatively slow to change. And so, you know, I think about that, you know, the, excuse me, the soft underbelly associated with, with attacking a big, you know, gargantuan industry, you know, that's inherently sort of a neat thing to be going after because if you can get that better mousetrap, uh, you ought to be able to find a, a, a way to, to make it work. And, I keep coming back to, in general, you got to think about what, what the cost of alternatives are. People aren't going to make changes, in general, if it's not economic for them. And so, you know, this entire industry has to make things that make conventional energy less economic or it's more economic. Um, there are, are really cool Teslas that go a long way. They cost a hundred and something grand. Right? You're not going to change the world at $150,000 a car. So uh, the conventional energy umbrella has expanded. The prices are generally higher than they have been historically. And so that, that in theory, is creating a lot of headroom uh, for clean tech to attack. So what do I, what do I take away from, from all of this? Um, if we call conventional energy guys in suits the dinosaurs, right? The dinosaurs lived a long time before they became extinct, right? So I think that thinking we're not going to be driving cars that use gasoline for a long, long time is, is incorrect. Um, you know, 80 to 100, $5 gas. That's our umbrella. Um, if it's uneconomic, over time it's unsustainable, right? Things have to make money to work. It takes a long time for people to make changes. And so that transition period, you've got to be ready to, to outlast that. And then in general, you know, the better mousetrap, assuming it works, uh, is, is indeed a better product. So on the right-hand side here, I have my dinosaur who loves clean tech. Why? Because we figured out that we've got to have all the energy uh, out there that we can, right? Ultimately, if the population of 7 billion is going to 9, uh, we're going to have to have more of everything, and so getting there is going to take uh, everybody's effort. So uh, with that, I will conclude, and if there are any questions, I think maybe we've got five minutes for questions. Brad, is that right? So who's the brave person with the first question? And if, you wear, if you're wearing a tie, like this gentleman, you, you get extra points. Yeah, the question was, where's the six to one for gas to oil? I think it's gone. It's gone for a while. Um, in theory, we have a global oil market and a local gas market. And until we can export freely any, all the gas we want, 
you're not going to get back to that BTU parity. So gas is essentially trapped in the U.S., and there's a lot of it. And it's going to be much lower priced than oil for a while. Um, but it's a big incentive for people to consume gas instead of oil. And so that's why you're hearing a lot about the Pickens plan. That's why you're hearing and seeing all of the, the actions around converting fleets from diesel to, to natural gas. So um, the incentives are there. It takes a long time. The cycle time issue is tough. But um, it will be a long time before we're thinking about six to one uh, gas and oil, I think. Other questions? Yeah, the question was China and their shale resource and how quickly will they lever it. Um, they probably do have a lot of shale. Uh, big state-run entities for the most part. Um, the answer is a lot slower than we have and faster than Europe. Um, you can make things happen in China with a will. They seem to be developing the will. Um, there's a lot less knowledge around the extraction processes, if you will, horizontal drilling, et cetera, in China than there are here. And so short answer to a complicated question is they're, they're probably going to be the most successful non-North American, but it's still going to be slow. It's going to take them 25 years to do what we do in 10. Sir. You bet. Glad you enjoy it. Yeah. New, new regulations. Um, November will make a difference. So the election and who's president. Um, I think the, the reality is that um, whether it's power or gasoline, so flipping on a light switch or driving your car, um, people expect that to be available to them. Uh, and when it costs more, they don't like it. Um, so the push-pull here is that um, fracking is viewed as bad, and therefore the way you fix bad things is you oversee it and regulate it and, and make it more difficult to do. Um, raising costs, on the, on the other hand, is not something you want to do and hurt the driving public or the electricity-using public in general. So my answer is I think we're going to see more regulation. I don't see it as stifling. Um, I think that... Uh, the higher prices go, one, the more people, the more the industry can pay, and two, the more desire to punish oil companies will be. And so um, I'm a big arguer for the fact that right now at $90 crude, $4 gasoline, you do not want prices higher because it just you might make some short-term cash flow, but you're going to take a lot of long-term pain to get there, and you're probably killing demand. So more regulation, but not stifling regulation. Other questions? Sir. Will Mexico undo the 1925 <laughs> Will Mexico undo their laws? Um, making that kind of prognostic. So the answer is I don't know. Um, what that would do, I think what you're referring to is that would essentially allow them to allow foreign companies to come in and participate in the hydrocarbon business there. Um, they have been slow to follow. There's a lot of trends in the U.S. that stretch into Mexico, and they're not exploiting them nearly as effectively as we are. Um, but I don't see a lot of companies aggressively getting ready to make that move. And so it feels to me like that's also one of these long cycle things. If it happens, it's going to be slow. It doesn't feel soon. Anybody else? What's your view on uh, the United States on uh, greenhouse gas and uh, climate change? What's my view on greenhouse gas and climate change? Wow. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of debate around the science on climate change, and I think that the reality is the dinosaurs have already lost there. 
because people believe that there is climate change and greenhouse gas is bad. And so at the, at the end of all of it, that sort of doesn't matter. You know, uh, perception becomes reality. And so uh, I think that what we've seen is it is very difficult to create any kind of, you address those issues via policy, and we haven't had a government that's been able to generate much energy policy. There are a lot of things that are more important. And so I don't see a lot of change coming on the, those fronts for a while because most of them involve making energy more exp conventional energy more expensive. And that is a tough thing to do politically when the economy is weak. So wait for an economic rebound, and then I think you see the issue get more traction. And that's a way of answering the question without having an opinion. Um, <laughs> Th thank you guys very much. I'll turn it back to Brad.